Welcome to the show with personal brand authority, Lita Citroen. Lita is an award-winning executive coach, speaker, and author working with clients in over 30 countries. She helps professionals, entrepreneurs, and business leaders manage the way they're perceived by the people who matter most. From leadership development, executive presence, to strategic communications and social media positioning, Lita's work is thoughtful, motivating, and practical. Get ready for a great program. Here's Lita. Well, hello, hello. Welcome to another Live with Lita, where we are streaming live on Instagram and on LinkedIn. Really excited for today's program because what we're going to do is every other month or so, we're going to deliver stories of people who have impactful influence. And today's going to be no exception. You are going to be so thrilled with the person I'm going to be bringing up here in a moment. But if you've ever been on one of my lives before, you know, one of the things I really enjoy about this format is hearing where you are. Where are you in your city, in a state, in the country? What country, city, state are you dialing in from today? Let's go ahead and drop those in the chat as I start the introduction of our program. It's always fun to see where everybody's coming in from. It also helps us kind of gauge the content of the program to meet you where you are. If you've been following me for any length of time, you know I'm deeply passionate about this topic of influence. In fact, I have a book coming out in August of this year worldwide that is all about sort of pivoting the concept of influence on its head and giving all of us, where whether we fit the mold or we don't, the opportunity to have our voices heard. So in leading into that, we're really focused on branding, reputation management, but also this concept of influence. And I wanted us to start off today by thinking about the people who inspire us, the people who are influencing us on a daily basis. Maybe you have a family friend or a spouse or a politician or a community leader, maybe your boss. Who are the people in your day-to-day -day that are influencing you? Which means you're volunteering to follow them, right? You're not being led by them because it's your job description. They're not coercing you into followership. They're influencing and inspiring you to become better, to grow and do more. These are the people who are influencing you. When I think of the people who influence me, it's people who are taking risks, who are taking chances and putting themselves out there in courageous and bold ways. I look at my friends in the military that I've spent 15 years getting to know and working alongside as they make the transition from the military culture into the civilian culture. And when I hear about their stories of resilience and courage and service, inclusivity and visibility, I'm encouraged, I'm inspired, and I'm influenced by what they've done to want to do more for myself. I think about my son who has built a tremendous career in his field and pushes back against traditional models of sales, which is, let's face it, a little bit of dialing for dollars. Uh, and he focuses more on the relationship piece and what that means and, and how he's leaned into that authentic and real side of who he is to be able to make that connection. I think about artists who've moved me to tears just by seeing their work hanging in a museum and what goes into that and the story behind it. They're leveraging their voice to tell a story and rise up and raise up other voices. I think about the TED Talks that I watch. And if you're not a fan of watching TED Talks, start today. There are some fabulous TEDx and TED Talks out there. These are sometimes real people who are sharing an experience that they've been through and they're using their narrative and their voice to influence communities, societies, companies, and all of us wherever we are. So again, as we have the conversation, I see a couple of you have. Thanks, Sean, for telling us where you are, South Carolina. Very nice. Um, tell us where you're dialing in from today. What part of the world, what part of the U.S., what part of the city are you in? And let us know in the chat. 
But today we're going to focus on one person in particular who has quite an unusual story. And you're going to just absolutely love to hear about him. He represents so many things that I talk about in this book. So I really wanted Adrian to be my very first guest on this LinkedIn Live. Instagram Live, talking about the power of influence. Because when we think about influence, when we think about people who are real, people who are courageous, who are taking chances, right? Doing things different than maybe how they've always been done before. They've built trust. They're serving their own community and perhaps other communities. And they're being inclusive in the voice that they share and their own voice to make sure that everyone is represented and seen in the room. These are the things I talk about in this book, and that's why my first guest is so exciting to me. Let me go ahead and introduce him. Um, I had to cut back a four-page bio to get it to something that sounds a little more like a soundbite, but you're going to absolutely love hearing from him. Adrian Miller is a James Beard award-winning food writer, an attorney, and a certified barbecue judge. I want to know how you get that job, because that just sounds amazing, who lives in my hometown of Denver, Colorado. Adrian is also recognized from appearing and fe being featured in the Netflix hit, High on the Hog, How Amer African American Cuisine Transformed America. Fabulous. From 1999 to 2001, Adrian served as special assistant to President Bill Clinton for an initiative that was just getting off the ground called One America. It was the first freestanding office in the White House to address issues of racial, religious, and ethnic reconciliation. Groundbreaking back in those times. He's currently the executive director for the Colorado Council of Churches, and as such, is the first African American and the first lay person to hold that position. He's also written three best selling, award winning books, and maybe you've read one of these. The first was Soul Food The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine, One Plate at a Time. Then came The President's Kitchen Cabinet the story of African-Americans who have fed our first families from the Washingtons to the Obamas. And finally, his latest one is called Black Smoke, African-Americans and the United States of Barbecue. Please help me welcome to the stage my friend and soon to be yours, Adrian Miller. Hi, Adrian. Lita, what's happening? How, I mean, just reading your bio, I'm like drooling, wanting, you know, I can smell the barbecue in the air. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad to be on this podcast with you, this uh, live um, interview. And, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to just get on your level. You know that, right? Hardly, hardly. Um, I, I just don't know how you don't weigh 800 pounds, but that's a story we've had offline, I know. So as I read your intro, here I am thinking of people that I want to highlight who have really leaned into that which they are so passionate about. And I do know a little bit about your story. I, I think we first met when you were coming out of the White House and many years ago, and we're looking to get into politics here in Colorado. You had your eyes on a senator seat. That was your path as an attorney. But then you made this hard left and went a very different direction. Can you talk a little bit about what happened, what made you make that, that, that pivot, and what you learned about yourself in the process? Sure. So, yeah. So, um, you know, 2001, I'm coming out of the Clinton White House and my goal was to one day be one of the senators representing my home state of Colorado. So I was trying to get back to Colorado and start my political career because, uh, you know, you got to run office and then make your way up the ladder. Um, but the job market was really slow. Um, and I was watching a lot of daytime television because I was in D.C. much longer than I ever thought. I'm really embarrassed to tell you what shows I was watching at the time. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> so I know bad. So in the depth of my depravity, I said, you know, I should read something. So I went to a local bookstore and I'd always like to cook. And so I saw this book called Southern Food at Home on the Road in History by a guy named John Edgerton, who wrote this book in the late 80s. And in that book, he wrote this one sentence that changed my life. Hmm. The history of African-American or Black achievement in American cookery has yet to be written. So, you know, I'm reading this 14 years later. I'm thinking somebody's done this. So I just tracked him down on the internet, emailed him, told him I was a fan of his book and just asked him, you know, you wrote this one sentence. Do you still think this is true? And he said, you know, for the most part, nobody's taken on the full story. There's always room for another voice. So why not yours? 
So with no qualifications at all, except for eating a lot of soul food and cooking it some, that's what started my journey. Wow. And so did you abandon the political path and fully lean into this direction? Was it a little bit of a hybrid for a while? Yeah, it was a hybrid for a while. So I did get a political job. I worked at something called the Bell Policy Center in Denver, which is a progressive think tank it's statewide, but located in Denver. And so I was kind of an amateur grad student. So after work and on the weekends, I went to our world class library, the Denver Public Library, and just gathered everything I could on African American food and traditions and culture. And um, I, I amassed enough information to write five books. So this is the research that I did. Um, I read 3,500 oral histories of formerly enslaved people and just listed every reference to food. Um, I read about 500 cookbooks, half of them authored by African-Americans because I wanted to put black food traditions in a larger culinary context. So I wanted to see you know, what was going on with other cuisines around the world, what was similar, um, different. Um, talked. I read thousands of newspaper magazine articles because now we have people that are digitizing these sources like the Library of Congress and their word searchable. Um, talked to hundreds of people and then because I care so deeply about my subject, I decided to eat my way through the country. So I went to 150 soul food restaurants in 35 cities in 15 states. And you still fit on an airplane? I did because, you know, um, I was walking a lot and, um, you know, small portions, stretching out meals. I didn't get fat until I got a day job, um, you know, like a desk job. <laughs> but um, so I was doing this on the side with my um, with my policy job. And then um, I was working for Colorado's governor, Bill Ritter, Jr. And then he decided not to run for reelection. So at that point, that's when I really decided to dive into it and just go for it and just spend, you know, devote my time 100 percent to writing this book on soul food, not knowing at all how it was going to play out. One of the things I, I've learned myself and I write about it in, in my work is that when we find that sense of purpose, right, if, if when we get that inkling that I think I'm supposed to go that direction or I think I'm supposed to lean into that, it almost becomes non-negotiable. Right. I've worked with clients who it wasn't an option, right? There was no other alternative path. It, it was so part of their DNA that they couldn't break free of that. Is that how it happened for you? Or was it more like a slow burn? You know, oh, or it just kept, it kept building. And then you realize this is something I could really do and make it make a difference in the community I want to serve. It was more of a slow burn, but that's really just because of the limitations I put on myself. Um, being risk averse, um, conservative when it came to, you know, life choices and things like that. So, you know, I was always just kind of hemming and like, I don't know if I could make it as an author. Um, and then there wasn't really a role model for me. There were some people who were writing about African-American food, but nobody was taking kind of this scholarly look mm. at soul food, really. The only person that came close was a woman named Jessica B. Harris, whose book, is High on a Hog, that Netflix uh, smash hit. That's her her book. The series is based on her book. So I didn't have a lot of role models. So the fact that I was creating my own tradition was a little bit scary as well. So all of that kept me just hemmed in. And then, you know, a lot of people around me were like, oh, dude, don't you know, why are you going to write about soul food? <laughs> you went to Stanford. You're going to write about soul food. Uh, so, you know, I just all these external voices as well as internal voices kept me from really moving on it. But then um, when, when Governor Ritter decided not to run for election, I just had a, a moment of self-realization. I just knew that I was just going to research this thing to death. And if I just didn't go for it, it would always be kind of lingering. And so, you know, when you have something that's singing at your soul, um, you know, at some point you got to you got to confront it and decide whether you're going to pursue that thing or not. And, and you said that was that line, there's always room for another voice. Why not yours? Did that, I mean, it sounds like that spoke to you in a, in a real way that perhaps it, it hadn't before, or you hadn't heard a message like that before. No, not really. Cause a lot of times you just hear, oh, that's not going to work. Um, and you know, and I heard this from literary agents, book publishers, you know, I kept hearing, nobody wants to read that. You know, no one's interested in that. So the fact that this guy who was an established author and an expert in his field was saying, no, no, no. Uh, and encouraging that, that meant a lot. It at least planted the seed that I could either water <laughs> and let flourish or, mm -hmm. you know, let it just lie dormant. Um, so it was really that encouragement. And so I, I try to do the same thing now when people approach me with their dreams, whatever they are, I try to encourage them, but temper it with some realism. Uh, but I do try to be encouraging. 
let's let's talk a little bit about soul food because I admit I didn't know I I mean anything compared to what I learned getting to know you and watching your online material and reading your books and and our conversations. What do you think are some of the biggest misnomers about the category of soul food? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest ones is that soul food is slave slavery food and poverty food. Now there is a correlation uh, because of the black experience in this country. But a soul food is much more complex. What I tell people is that soul food is bringing together the culinary ingredients, techniques, and traditions of three parts of the world, West Africa, Western Europe, and the Americas. And this all comes together in the American South during the antebellum period. Um, and so it's it's much more complex, and, a, and it's a really interesting story. So I think that's one misnomer. The other one I would say that's huge is that soul food needs a warning label, that if you eat it, it's going to kill you. And, you know... Again, there's some basis in fact on this, but um, what I try to educate people on is that soul food is the celebration food mm. of the American South that African-Americans took outside the South and transplanted in other parts of the country. And I don't care what cuisine you're talking about. If you eat the celebration aspects of that food, of that cuisine, you know, the stuff that's high in sugar, fat, calories, whatever, it's not going to be good for your body, regardless of the cuisine. And so um, when you take a closer look at soul food uh, and you listen to what nutritionists are telling us to eat right now, more dark leafy greens, more sweet potatoes, more fish, okra is a superfood, hibiscus. These are all parts of soul food. So it's about moderation. It's understanding the context and realizing you do not have a constitutional right to daily consumption of fried chicken and barbecue and peach cobbler and all of these glorious things. It was special occasion food that people only had every once in a while. And the thing, the, the miracle about our food system today, some would say miracle, some would say, you know, tragedy, is that you can have these celebration foods not only once a day, but multiple times a day if you want to. So it's about con context is hugely important. So one of the thing is, things that I know is, is that you don't just, you know, go to bookstores and talk to people about the food, but you also go into corporations and um, firms that are using it as a way to enlighten and lift up voices around the DEI conversation. Talk a little bit about how that bridge came to be and, and what you use that for. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been talking about these things for about 10 years now. Um, my soul food book came out in 20, uh, 2013. Okay. And so uh, as word got out about that book, I started getting more and more invitations. And now, um, you know, especially during Black History Month and Juneteenth, I've been asked to talk about these important kind of historical discussions through a lens of food. And food, I think, is very approachable. We all eat. Um, food is fascinating. And we're in a foodie moment in this country. I mean, there's such deep fascination about food, its backstory and all of these things that, you know, it's a coming, it's a good coming together moment for me. So um, the hallmark of my presentations is that I, you know, I talk about serious stuff um, that we need to address, but I do it in a informative and also entertaining way and food makes that very easy and so um yeah and, and, and a lot of people come out of my presentations are like you know what i never knew that mm -hmm. uh, even people that would say before going in they would say oh i yeah i know everything about soul food this brother can't tell me anything <laughs> and still they come out and say i didn't know that and i'm like yeah that's exactly the point so is there an example that you could share of where you're bridging the, or you're using food as a conduit to highlight something in history that is meaningful to you? Yeah, so I think one thing is we don't really have a sense of how slavery actually operated in the United States. We, we get a sense it was bad, it was horrible, but we don't mm -hmm. understand the logistics of it. So what I do is in my presentations, I actually walk through a typical day for an enslaved person on a large plantation. And I tell mm -hmm. people, you get, wake up at dawn, you go, you're fed out of a trough filled with crumbled up uh, cornbread and buttermilk. You have to eat with your hands or a seafood shell because a utensil is a, po a potential weapon. And slaveholders were always fearful of a rebellion. Then you go work out in the fields and then you come back for the midday meal. In the 19th century, the midday meal was called dinner. We call it lunch now. Mm -hmm. uh, that same trough was then filled with seasonal vegetables, maybe a little bit of meat to season the vegetables. You go work out in the fields until dusk. Then you come back and you get leftovers from that midday meal called supper. And that was the typical day. And then only on the weekends when the work schedule slowed, because on the large plantations, usually they stopped working at around noon on Saturday 
and got the rest of the weekend off until Monday morning. That's when people started making the high end foods because they had more time and they had access to those ingredients. The other big takeaway that surprised me as well is that you hear this narrative that soul food was wholly created for African-Americans. But as I started researching just how people ate, um, really, it's more about class and place. Pretty much people of the same socioeconomic class, regardless of their race, are eating the same foods. Now, because of racism, they're not eating together, but they're pretty much eating the same food. So that add, uh, added a layer of complexity to the food story that I just didn't um, really appreciate. Yeah. Well, and and so that's a great example of how you're using the vehicle of food to tell an important story about history that adds some more context to our day-to-day -day life. Right. And, it, and also shows that we have a lot more in common than what we think. Um, yeah. There are a lot of barriers telling us that how different we are. But actually, when you get to the facts peeled up through history, you actually see we have a lot of things in common. And then, you know, that knowledge is somehow getting lost. So now I feel joyful that I can bring that back together and say, no, no, no. You know what? We can come to the table and talk about some stuff and, and have fun doing it. So what is your goal when you go into these companies or you go into these law firms and you're talking, you know, whether it's Black History Month or Juneteenth, as you mentioned, or any time, right? Because people bring you in all over. Um, what is your purpose? What is the goal of that conversation for you? Well, it's really guided by my faith perspective, which I, I, I believe that we should love one another, mm -hmm. um, even though some people make that very difficult. And so um, I, I think talking about food and history and the way that I do, it, it creates an opportunity to, to build those connections and, and come together. And so I'm prodding people to think about something in a different way, something that they would like. And they're like, oh, well, I want to find out more. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's the, the, the high level. Um, goal that I have. And the second one is I, I want soul food to be celebrated. I think it's misunderstood and maligned. Um, and I want it to be celebrated as the truly wonderful thing that it is. Um, and so, you know, I, I just want much love from my culture. Absolutely. And I do see some of you. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, Bruce uh, in Florida. Scott, good morning. Be sure to let us know where you're dialing in from and start thinking of those questions that um, that you get to ask Adrian because he'll answer your questions. And, and to that point, I remember I watched one of your talks um, as, as I was getting ready for this and I learned so much. And that night at dinner, I mean, I was like, I couldn't stop talking to my husband. I was like, did you know how peach cobbler came to be? And did you know about this? And and he's like, I just want to eat my hamburger. But, you know, I'm like so excited because I think knowledge and learning, um, it's a tool that we use, but it's also a mindset. And when you learn something and then you want to share it, you know, when we think about influence, influence isn't just about having a direct relationship with one person. It's about knowing that if you inspire that person and you influence that person, they're going to want to go out and tell other people. And then- yeah, that's to your point, up. you're lifting up a community. Yeah, yeah. And that's been one of the most heartwarming parts of this journey. Because, you know, when you write a book, you're, you know, as an author, you're in isolation. You don't know if anybody's going to dig it. You hope they do. And you put this thing out in the world that you feel good about um, and you hope other people enjoy. And um, I, over the years, um, through social media or meeting people in person, that so many people have told me how my books have inspired them. I know personally that there is a collard green festival in San Diego that was started because of my book. Um, wow. Somebody read my greens chapter. Other people have started a, a journey of food writing or another way of finding their bliss. So that, that makes me feel good. Absolutely. Because, I mean, it, the, the bigness of the world becomes small in those moments. And we start feeling connected to each other as a humanity. Um, so I have to ask, because I know I have other questions, but what is your favorite soul food dish? So I just love greens. Um, and uh, for those who don't know what greens are, they're the dark leafy, um, dark leaves, you know, dark colored leaves of, of plants. We call them greens. Um, my favorite are um, mustard and turnip greens. I usually cook those with smoked mm. turkey these days just for a little healthier vibe. In soul food, the popular greens are collard, kale, mustard, turnip, and cabbage. Um, so I tell people, um, you know, if you've been introduced to kale in the last five to 10 years, welcome to the party. We've been eating them for about 300 <laughs> wow, that, that is my absolute favorite thing. And then if I if I could build out a meal, I would add black eyed peas for sure with some smoked ham hock. 
um, and some cornbread. And then I'm a big seafood fan, so I would do bone-in fried catfish. Really? Yeah. Wow. I really, I think there's just more flavor when you have the bones in in, in the fish. <laughs> but you got to get them out of your teeth, don't you? Yeah, but you know, you can, you can, you can master that. That's not, that's not hard. <laughs> Why do you think you're the right person to be leading this charge? I mean, you are now a soul food scholar. Why do you think it should it, it had to be you? Um, I think a lot of things, and some of them are not going to make a lot of sense. So I think the fact that I'm from Denver, Colorado actually helps me. It usually hurts me. I, I usually start my presentation saying, okay, I'm about to admit something that immediately loses me all street cred on the subject of soul food. I'm born and raised in Denver, Colorado. And then people start laughing and booing. And I'm like, okay, let me win you back. And so I taught those, tell the story of my parents. It's a great migration story. My Separately, they came to Denver in the 1960s. My mom from Chattanooga, Tennessee. My mm -hmm. dad from Helena, Arkansas. And I love my parents for a lot of things that they've done for me. But one thing I love is that even in a place like Denver and then later moving to the suburbs of Aurora, Colorado, a Denver suburb, they've, killed, they've kept me steeped in Black culture. Um, mm -hmm. So I kept going to a Black church uh, in the inner city of Denver. And they kept us in these Black food traditions at home. So being outside the South actually gave me a critical distance to assess the cuisine that I'm writing about. Um, so I think that was helpful. I think being a lawyer was helpful because it gave me an intellectual rigor that mm -hmm. I needed. So the unfortunate thing with food um, writing these days is that the food history is not well documented. So there's just a lot of people making stuff up. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to call them on it because there's not something definitive saying, no, you're wrong. So I think people understand that when I say something that I've taken the time to figure out what the right answer is. And of course, you know, I don't get everything right. But when somebody, somebody points out something that I've done wrong, hey, I admit it. And I put that the, the correct version of it because I believe and we're all trying to find the truth. We're really trying to be accurate about this history. Um, and then, you know, I, I got a sense of humor. So I think I'm, I'm able to deliver some of these things in a way that's helpful. Several people have told me that I should go into stand up. I've told them, hey, look, you know, you're not paying for these jokes. So that's why you think they're really funny. Uh, so I think all of that comes together um, and, and helps me be the right person to talk about these things. Is there an inaccuracy that stands out for you that perhaps has been told over time that we all just accept as true that you want to correct the record on here? Yeah, so I made this mistake as well. Um, so uh, for a long time, I was trying to figure out where fried chicken's from. And there are some that argue that it's from West Africa. But when you look at the history of kind of African, um, strictly West African food, the way that fried chicken in, is made is not the way that Africans make chicken. They usually do a fricassee method where there may be a quick fry just to sear it, but then it's braised in some kind of stew or liquid or something. So that's, you know, so this idea of cutting, getting a chicken, cutting it up, breading it, and then frying it in fat. This doesn't really seem African, even though there's deep fat frying traditions. So I was trying to look for it. I found some European um, articles that talk about the provenance of fried chicken. And there were several people that said, hey, Scotland is where it started from. So I put that out there. I'm like, OK, these several people did that. And then um, this uh, guy on the uh, Internet did a whole takedown of me explain why fried chicken is not from Scotland. I'm like, OK, you know, you could have just reached out to me and say, hey, man, you know, this is not right. Um, but, you know, I, I put that out. So uh, we don't know exactly where it comes from, but clearly fried chicken was floating around in Italy and France and England. Um, and so Scotland's probably not the place where it came from. So that's one mistake that I have made. Another one that I um, didn't make a mistake, but I've been trying to correct the record is barbecue. So mm -hmm. there are several that argue that barbecue is either European or African in origin when clearly it's from the Americas. The word barbecue doesn't even exist in any language until uh, Europeans come to the Americas and try to approximate the word that the indigenous people were using for the platform of sticks where food was cooked over a slow fire. So the word barbecue, which was barbacoa in Spanish, was what the Spanish sailors thought the indigenous people in the Dominican Republic, that's the first recorded encounter we have about barbecue, what they thought they heard them saying, Barbacoa becomes barbecue in English. So those are those are two big ex examples. But you know, um, there's some people that are just heavy, heavily invested in a certain narrative. And look, mm -hmm. I wanted to prove that fried chicken and barbecue and all these other things were from West Africa. You know, raise my fist and go Wakanda forever. But <laughs> I'm a guy that's into facts. So um, 
And I don't think it's bad to say, hey, you know, somebody else started this, but we put our own spin on it and mm -hmm. also created something beautiful. Well, we and, and, Americans, yeah. you know, one of the things I, I talk a lot about is an origin story, right? And and what you're almost doing is you're taking and you're creating and, and verifying the origin story of all these tall tales and all of these um, ingredients and products. And, and in doing so, you're also sharing your origin story. Uh, which, which I just think is absolutely fabulous because had you grown up in the South where this was, you know, all around you, maybe it wouldn't have that same pull in the same way that it does when you're in Denver, Colorado. And right. Yeah. That's exactly. really cool. Yeah. And the only thing I just want to say is that, nice. um, you know, because this past is so murky and undocumented, a lot of times uh, I tell my readers, hey, this basically is my best guess based on the things that I've read. And the hallmark of my books is there's an extensive bibliography. So I want people to go and look and see everything I read to reach that conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, because I know that after I put a book out, it's in a fixed period of time. And, you know, there's going to be other discoveries later that may, may shed a new light on something. So I just want people to understand, OK, this is why he says this based on what he's read. Hmm. That's really cool for anyone. When listening or watching the recording, listening to us live or watching the recording, what's one thing you want them to know or appreciate or ask more about? Um, I, I would love for people to ask more about soul food, um, to ask, you know, what is it, where does it come from? What are the dishes? And for people who are uh, familiar with Southern food, they're going to hear a lot of the same stuff. Um, but I, I would like people to more investigate um, soul food because I want people to understand it be willing to go to a restaurant and eat it and then actually go home and cook it because mm -hmm. uh, cuisines only become popular or mainstream um, when people feel comfortable going out to eat that food or cooking it at home. That's the story of Chinese food and Italian food in the United States and Mexican food, because those were marginalized groups as well in, in our in U.S. history. I mean, there was there are signs like, hey, you know, we don't want Italians here, or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And people don't really think of that now. But their food became popular. And I think food is often a gateway for people to start to learn and appreciate more about the people making that food and consuming that food for whom that food is part of their cultural traditions. Well, as, as the daughter of a Hungarian um, from my mother was born in Budapest, um, I grew up with real Hungarian goulash and not goulash. <laughs> There's no, you know, like little elbow macaroni noodle in it. And I know sometimes it can be a conflict because I want to, you know, pound my fist and say, that's not goulash. And they're like, well, you're saying it wrong. And it's like, no, you're saying it wrong. And so culturally, we can almost start you know, to have these conversations. But to your point, that's where conversation springs from. And to be able to talk about that and why certain ingredients are more important, whatever the vehicle, right, whether it's 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 a book, whether it's food, whether it's clothing, whether it's art, they're vehicles to start conversations. Right. And and unfortunately, we're in a time where it seems like people are reluctant to start those conversations for, for a variety of reasons. And so I hope through my work it gives people a, a reason to have a conversation. Um and then, you know, yeah. we, we have fewer spaces left in our in our country in, in the US where we come together. Uh and the table is one of them. And um, I want to keep that going as long as we can. I, I, as you say that, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with absolutely brilliant, beautiful, amazing client that I um, finished working with. And, and she talks about, you know, being willing to always have the difficult conversations. And she said, I'm not the person that will ever run away. I don't seek them out. I don't like, you know, create them. So I get to be part of it. But she said, I will never run away from them. And I asked her, I said, why do you think most people do, right? They avoid the tough, the tough topics. And she said, oftentimes there's ego involved. So if you can take ego out of it and you can come to a conversation, even if it's challenging and it might be, you know, challenging from a value standpoint or a cultural or a faith standpoint, but you can come from a position of curiosity, you're not giving anything up. You're increasing, it's expanding. And she said, my only goal is how can I serve the people that I'm most passionate about serving? So as long as I'm, I'm leading with that question, I will never avoid a conversation. And, and that has stuck with me months after hearing it, because I think to your point, 
we should learn about these things. It, it doesn't take anything away. It's not a zero sum game. I can learn about soul food and still know how to make authentic Hungarian goulash. And I make it really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean I'm giving anything up. Yeah. I, I think um, from my perspective, and I'm, I'm thinking more about discussions about race, um, mm -hmm. but it just seems like people um, don't want to go into a space where they may be the bad person. Um, so, there's, and there's a fear of saying the wrong thing, you know, mm -hmm. to alienate that person in that conversation. So I think the challenge for us uh, of goodwill is how do we create these spaces so that people feel welcome? And then, you know, when there is a tough conversation or something difficult is happening, how do we hold the tension and let that person, Hey, look, I still appreciate you as a human being. I want to hear what you have to say. I may not like it, may not agree with it. But in order for progress to happen, we just got to just got to listen to each other, hear each other out. I think a lot of problems in our country right now is because people feel like they're not heard and they're not valued and they're not respected. Um, and so, you know, I, again, we of goodwill need to keep creating these spaces. And even in, when we get rejected after we create those spaces, we still need to create them. Now, not everybody is equipped and has the energy to do that. And, you know, I, I got to say my energy for this is starting to wane a little bit. I still got a lot. But, um, you know, while I still have that energy, I'm willing to to be in those spaces. Yeah. And it is, it's choice. Right. But and I think it's coming into those conversations, not defensive and not judging, but curious, open, yeah. realizing at the end of the day, you still get to have your own beliefs. You still get to think the way you do. There's no harm in hearing another perspective. And food um, definitely sparks curiosity because somebody puts something in front of you you've never seen. You're like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. In some countries that can be scary though. Um, cause it's still moving, but I understand your point. I understand your point. So before we get to questions and we're going to take questions in a moment, um, what's next for you, Adrian? So I am very close to getting a couple of book deals, um, wow. in, you know, in my own mind. Um, so one will be a history of Asian American presidential chefs. So I've written about African American presidential chefs and other than uh, black people, uh, Asian Americans have had um, an Asian heritage people. Some of them were immigrants have had the strongest um, ethnic rep representation in the White House kitchen. So I want to tell their story, which has never really been told in a collective way. And then also um, I'm working on a book longer term on the history of African-American street food vendors. Uh, so I want to show how they repped uh, West Africa and the way they dressed, um, you know, the calls, the, the, the songs that they created. They're called calls or street cries mm -hmm. um, and the foods that they popularized uh, and how they shaped the foods of various cities from New Orleans all the way to Boston on the East Coast and then uh, in Gulf South and then uh, Chicago. You don't see a lot of West Coast stuff, more like LA and San Francisco, but um, you know, I'm at the very beginning of my research, so maybe there's more stories. But here's the really cool thing. Between 1880 to 1920, people would listen to African Americans singing to get your attention so you would buy their stuff, and they put <laughs> it down to sheet music. And I have about a hundred of those. So my hope is to get a book deal where I can put out a compilation of those street cries and uh, narrate them and then have somebody sing them because you don't want to hear me sing. Uh, and then, you know, it would be like you didn't know what it was like to walk around New Orleans um, in 1900 with someone trying to get you to buy their, you know, their rice beignets or their pralines. Um, so I think that'd be really cool. That sounds amazing. And where can people find you? Where 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 do you want to point them to? Website, Instagram? Where would you like people to, to find out more about you? Well, you know, I like to make it really easy for people. So if you just remember Soul Food Scholar, regardless of the platform, you'll find me. So soulfoodscholar.com is my website. Then on X, formerly known as Twitter, I'm Soul Food Scholar. And then Instagram, Soul Food Scholar. And then I have a Soul Food Scholar Facebook page. And then on Threads, Soul Food Scholar. So you'll find me just do Soul Food Scholar. Brand repetition. Love it. Love it. So as we get ready for any questions that y'all might be thinking about, um, and Sabrina, thank you, has put uh, some of your handles in the chat. You know, I, I think what I'm really reflecting on is that question that stopped you in your tracks, right? Which is why not you? We, we do have a lot of people right now who are unhappy. They're, they're stressed. They're anxious. Global unrest, you know, political unrest, you know, what's happening in this country with the economy and just with job security and families have changed. And there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of angst right now. 
But what if you're the person that needs to make that change? What if you're the person, as Adrian was when he was tapped by that book, that is supposed to write the book that hasn't been written yet? What if you're the person who's supposed to speak out on something, whether it's raising your hand in a meeting or starting a movement? What if it's you and we've all just been waiting for you to find the courage and the authenticity and the community to be able to speak your path and speak your truth and speak your voice. So I encourage anyone listening to use Adrian's story as inspiration for, you know, one person who did it, who, you know, I'm sure is probably still paying off those, you know, Stanford <laughs> educational fees and Georgetown law. Actually, you know what? Stanford wasn't that bad. I, I yeah. came out of Stanford with very little debt. It was law school that killed me. I'm still paying off law school. Well, you know, and, and that's probably not inexpensive. So, <laughs> um, but you know, maybe it is you. Maybe it's not the right, the exact right time, or the circumstances aren't exactly perfect. You know, look at people who've taken risk. Look at people who have leaned in and said, "This is uncomfortable. I'm going to ask the hard questions. I'm going to put myself out there." You talk about not being a risk taker. I'm not a risk taker. And I started my business in 2008 as the entire U.S. economy was collapsing. With mm. two kids about to go to college, I decided to start a business with zero clients. So there are people that you can learn from and lean on and really get inspired from who are influencing these important conversations. I, If you aren't already following me, please follow and subscribe to my newsletter on LinkedIn so that we can stay in touch and you can hear about next conversations. I will tell you that next month, I'm going to go back to that short form format for our lives where I'm going to give you more of those power moves for building influence. Following that, we're going to have a fabulous conversation with a woman who is going to knock your socks off with what she has done in terms of leaning into the uncomfortable. And we're going to keep building out these programs throughout the year. So really look forward to hearing them. Uh, we do have a question came in from Scott. Hi, Scott. Uh, let's see, Sabrina, if you wouldn't mind bringing that over. Scott says, did you notice recipes evolving from one generation to the next? Adrian, I'm assuring this is a question for you. Or do they stay the same based on family traditions? Great uh, question. Great question. So I would say it's a little bit of both. But uh, I think the big change is um, there has been this trend, which I call down home healthy. And the idea is to make traditional soul food healthier um, in terms of the you know, celebration food. So, for instance, instead of using pork to flavor vegetables, people might use smoked turkey mm. or no meat at all and just really kick up the spices. Um, and then also um, cutting back on the sugar and the fat. So that's the thing that I've noticed, noticed the first of the most. So instead of say, for instance, fried chicken, you would do oven fried chicken or mm. uh, one of the most popular recipes in my first book on soul food is a Creole broiled catfish. So instead of frying the catfish, rubbing it with olive oil, putting on your favorite Creole spice and then broiling it for about seven minutes till it's opaque. So yes, um, I have noticed, uh, especially in cookbooks that people are shifting, um, and I think it's just because soul food is being blamed for a lot of health impact outcomes that people feel like soul food is the problem. And I think it's broader than that. I think a lot of people are loading up on junk food and convenience food and all this other stuff. And that's leading to the, the health outcomes that we're seeing in the African-American community. That's another story for another day. But yeah, you, you see you, you do see this effort to make it healthier. And I would say this also, the hottest trend in soul food right now is vegan. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's wow. where you're seeing the most creativity right now. And and if you go back to what enslaved African-Americans were actually eating, it's very close to what we call vegan today. Um, because the, hmm. the processed food, the stuff with meat, that was considered pre prestigious. And African-Americans did not have the social status to have regular access to enjoy that um, as a, as a, a food on, on frequent occasions. So um, so yeah, so vegan is not a departure from traditional soul food. It's really a homecoming. Fascinating. What other questions do you have? Um, I, I'm, I'm sure people are like in their kitchen cooking as we're talking, because I know my stomach is growling just hearing you talk about this. Um, but as you think of any other questions, you know, um, do you cook, do you cook Adrian or, or are you just eating out all the time? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm eating out way more than I should, but you know, I want to support the restaurant industry in this challenging time. That's what I, that's what I tell myself. But uh, yeah, I do cook, um, not professionally trained, but I'm a good home cook. 
so yeah, it's soul food, um, kind of Southwestern food growing up in Denver, um, I would say are my wheelhouses. And then, you know, I'm dabbling with some other things, but yeah, soul food, Southern and Southwestern are the things that I love to cook the most. I, I do want to go back to something that you, you said earlier about, you know, why me? Uh, so one thing I have noticed, and this was me as well, is that I think a lot of people, when they're pursuing their dream, they keep it close to the to the chest because they don't want somebody else to steal it. And I understand that because, you know, ideas and things do get stolen. But I think that goes back to the why me thing. As long as you have confidence that you're the one to tell that story in a certain way, it shouldn't keep you from sharing that dream. Like, for instance, I just told you what my next books are going to be about and gave some detail. Now, some people are like, well, I can't believe that. Somebody's going to do that. I'm like, OK, they can go ahead and do it, but they're not going to do it as well as I can do it. Right. Um, and or from your voice. Yeah. yeah. And wonderful things have happened for me because I've shared my dream. That's how I got my book deal. Um, that's how I got an agent. Um, and a lot of good. And people respond to someone who is pursuing a dream. They may you know, think you're a little crazy or whatever, but people respond to it. And then when you actually fulfill that dream, they go wild. Because a lot of people like, you know, have come up to me in the years since my first book has come out. And they said, you know what, Adrian? A lot of people talk, but you actually did it. And these are people that I didn't even know had a clue what was going on with me and my writing career. So that's been very gratifying. I love that. Love that. Evelyn has a question. Thank you for your service on food history. Have you done any memoir or narrative style writing on food from your family or life experiences? Ooh, maybe that's your next, next book. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's thank you for Evelyn for that. So several people have told me that. And, you know, I'm just being my humble self. I'm just like, nobody wants to read my story. I mean, there should be more interested in other people's story. So that's, I'm focused on the other people's stories uh, right now. So I haven't really thought about memoir. I've done some uh, article writing in memoir form. Um, my mother, Donetta Miller, died in 2015. And uh, a couple of years after that, I did a Mother's Day tribute to her for the Washington Post on her banana pudding. Uh, so I've, I've, I've woven in elements, but I haven't really thought about just like writing my story. So thanks for the prod. Uh, <laughs> well, but, maybe we'll have you back when, when you do that. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. Anything else before we let you get back to all of the good food that you're likely cooking and eating um, and get back to our day jobs? Anything else you'd like to add? Well, yeah, so to that point, um, if you're following your dream, I highly encourage you not to quit your day job <laughs> until <laughs> that side hustle or whatever is lucrative enough for you to live on. Uh, because I, I talked to a lot of people who want to write books and they really don't understand how challenging it is to make a lot of money on your book. Um, they just think they're going to be a bestseller. And mm -hmm. that is like pro athlete level stuff. The very few mm -hmm. people reach that level. Most of us are hustling. Um, and, uh, you know, I can tell people I don't really make a lot of money on my books per se, but it's really the speaking gigs. So like the, the books are a business card that give me uh, speaking gigs and other things. So, you know, um, but I, th I think we covered the main things that I wanted to, to cover today. So, uh, Fabulous. oh, yeah. I, if I may, I give some life advice to me or to everyone, to everyone. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't need this. Um, well, maybe you do, but I don't think you do. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned this Creole catfish uh, recipe that's the most popular recipe in my book. And that recipe is from a former girlfriend. So here's the life advice. If you're in a relationship with someone who's a really good cook, you know, do what you can to stay with that person. But if you notice that things are getting rocky, I can tell you from personal experience that it's a lot easier to get recipes before you break up. That's the life advice. Oh my goodness, Adrian. With that, boom, boom, tsh. All right. Thank you so much. We have way too much fun when we get together. Um, please join me next month for another live where we'll be streaming on LinkedIn and on Instagram. Like my newsletter, subscribe so you'll get all the information and look forward to seeing you on social media. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for everyone who entered into the chat. Thank you, Sabrina, for keeping all the behind the scenes running. And we'll see you all back here uh, live with Lita next month. Be safe.